Alaska Workshop, radio's foremost laboratory of writing and production techniques, presents Legend in Brocade, written by Margaret LeWirth and based on the famous letters of Lord Chesterfield, directed by Rocco Tito, with a special musical score by Curtis Beaver. <laughs> London in the year 1769. George III sits bewigged and powdered on his throne. On this night, the lamps outside the great house in South Audley Street are shrouded in mist. This is the house, driver. Pull up here. Oh, there. 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 there you are, ma'am. Yes, this is it. I'd know it even on a night like this. I think you'd better wait. You'll have to pay for waiting time. I know, I know. Yes, you'd better wait. As you say, ma'am. But down the street a little bit. I don't want a public act waiting right here. All right, ma'am. I'll be there. Yes, madam? I've come to see Lord Chesterfield, please. Your name, madam? I'd rather not send up my name. Tell him it's in regard to his son. Yes, madam. You will not send up your name. I've traveled some distance to see his lordship. Madam, may I make a suggestion? Well? His lordship has already retired to his chambers. He does not like to be disturbed when he's writing. Writing, eh? More of those letters. Oh, I'm well acquainted with them. If it hadn't been for some of those letters, I... Well, no matter... This can't concern you. Will you tell Lord Chesterfield I'm here? I can't do that, madam. I told you he had retired. How dare you refuse to announce me? I will gladly take up your name. I don't wish... Undoubtedly, you're paid well for this. Suppose I come back tomorrow. I think you could see his lordship then. What time? At 11. He is usually at leisure. After he has inspected the melon vines. I shall return tomorrow at 11. Jeffrey. Jeffrey. Uh, yes, Your Lordship. Another log on the fire. And uh, set the candles closer. Are you writing late again, sir? And why not? Oh, you haven't been well, my lord. Uh, would you have me lie in bed and stare into the darkness? There's still much I must write to him. I know, sir. I know that. So much I wish for him. Uh, uh, build up the fire. And, uh, Jeffrey. Tonight, bring me a glass of Madeira to go with it. Your Lordship, Jeffrey? Jeffrey? I'm an old man condemned to life in a dressing gown and a nightcap. From the frames on those walls, a row of critical, sharp-nosed, and vigorous ancestors looks down on me. I will not make myself further ridiculous before them by catering to a god-ridden leg. The Madeira, please. And, uh, yes, my wig. A man's appearance, Jeffrey is the cornerstone of his self-confidence. Yes, your lordship. Yeah. Now, leave me to continue my letter writing. My dear friend, your last two letters have alarmed me extremely. Philip, my son, my only son, where are you tonight? What company do you keep? What have you done with the words I've poured out to you? Thirty-eight years of counsel and hope and advice. Tonight they haunt me, those thin little papers that carried all I knew about the world and its ways and the men and women who live in it. They've no doubt served well to light the fires in your grate. Have they lit any fire in your heart? My son, I have no new words for you tonight. Only a prayer. You have accepted some of the things I wrote you. Perhaps you would if you understood why I wrote them. I've never told you that. It's buried in the years. Tonight, a woman came to this house in your name. You remember what I wrote you years ago. The words come back. 
Women have in general but one object, which is their beauty. A man of sense only trifles with them, humors them. You may safely flatter any woman from her understanding down to the exquisite taste of her fan. But women have, from the weakness of men, more or less influence in all courts. Choose them carefully, address them respectfully, and always appeal to their vanity. They can establish or destroy your reputation in the world. I wrote you that about all women, my son. All but one. Tonight, she comes back to me across the years. I would like you to know her as I did. It was the year I was ambassador at The Hague. And I was young and ambitious. And life was very rich. <laughs> oh, your pardon, my Lord Chesterfield. Madame Dubuchet. I did not know you were at your letters. The emptiest of tasks when you enter the room. Come in, Mary, please. Thank you. Oh, the mails from England. Mm -hmm. How dull. Well, they are irritating, annoying, cajoling, commanding, but they are not dull. When they've sent you to The Hague as ambassador, why do they not leave you alone? The Foreign Office must have something to do. Then leave it to the Foreign Office. <laughs> Here is the whole place full of lights and music and people and you sit at a desk. Madam, a thousand pardons. I didn't realize I was guilty of neglect. I had but one dispatch to send and I've done that. But don't think for a moment that your voice and your charms couldn't call me from the most arduous of duties. I think that I shall see you no more, Lord Chesterfield. What? And take the moon and stars from the evening? Why do you talk to me like that? Because I believe it. No, you don't. You talk to all women like that. Frau von Kleig, who, who dances like an elephant, who mm -hmm. bent over her hand as though she were one of the three graces, and that plain Hilda Gould. <laughs> she positively giggled behind her fan. How observant you are. No, no, I'm not. I wasn't even noticing no one could help but see. Mary, my very dear. I'm not your dear. Not more than any other woman. Yes, you are. And I won't be flattered into submission. You don't understand, do you, lovely and untamed as you are, that the world is full of men and women, and we are in it to get along with them. Only by pleasing them, saying the things that they want to hear, can we achieve our own end. Well... Leave me out of it, then. Oh, my dear, what would you discuss tonight? The pragmatic sanction, the refusal of the town of Briel to concur in the new treaty? Why, oh, you're so logical, so relentlessly logical. Sorry. <laughs> Manners, my lord, Chesterfield, are a lovely facade. But somewhere under them, there should be a heart. Excuse me, His Excellency Herr Link awaits me for supper. <laughs> Lovely, my son. Of course, she was wrong, but she was lovely. I watched her that evening. She danced like a leaf on water. If I couldn't tell her that, she would have laughed. I could only write you years later, my son. Your dancing master is at this time the man in all Europe of greatest importance to you. You must dance well in order to sit, stand, and walk well, and present yourself with dignity in genteel company. <laughs> Many drives and many suppers, balls and parties. Years later, my son, I wrote you what I had learned from that crowded, glittering, gay life. Whatever a man is at court, he must be genteel and well-bred. That cloak covers many follies. A man's own good breeding is his best security against other people's ill manners. Knowledge gives weight, but accomplishments give luster. The most useful art of all is that of pleasing. Proper secrecy is the only mystery of able men. If you would be a favorite of your king, address yourself to his weaknesses. I learned all those things and many others. But I learned one thing I never could write you in the later years. So 
something every man must find out for himself. It was one day, late in the fall, after a long drive in the country. Sit down, Philip. Hmm? You don't have to go to that stupid embassy now. Oh, my dear Marie, I cannot teach her respect for my vocation, can I? <laughs> no. Well, I'm very glad. I wouldn't have liked all this if you'd held rank and office up to me. I didn't really mean that. Uh-huh. I am impressed by the British ambassador and his attention. Oh, no, you're not. You're not one bit. If all this didn't amuse you, the British ambassador and his attentions could knock at your door the rest of the season, then you'd know it. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes when I wonder what manner of man you are, I think of your saying these things, and then I know. You know what? That you are really human. Oh, you doubt that too? No, not really. This has been too wonderful. These past weeks, to doubt that. It has been all that. When I came here to The Hague for the King, I never expected to find among the archives and folios of my duties anything or anyone so lovely. Thank you. Uh-huh. And when I go, I shall never expect to find it again. Go? Are you leaving? Yes. When my mission is accomplished. Fortunately for me, the laws of Holland require that not only the state, but every town and every province ratify our treaty. It's made it a pleasantly long stay. I didn't think of your going away. I haven't wanted to. Mary, you've taught me a great many things. I have taught you. Yes. It is true, I believe that manners are the very essence of life, that grace and breeding are the very air we must breathe. But you have taught me they can be hollow and they can be false. I wouldn't want you ever to think that. You cannot help it. Because you were an utterly natural woman. The only woman I've ever known who could mix reason and beauty, finesse and frankness. Believe me, my dear, in the years ahead... In salons and courts, I shall never bow over the hand of a lady who dances like an elephant without hearing that sardonic and teasing laughter of yours. <laughs> What's the matter, my dear? You're not amused. I was thinking of the years ahead. In those salons and courts. We won't think about them. Oh, yes, yes, we will. We must. I'm glad you haven't minded my laughter. But you haven't quite understood it. I wouldn't change a fragment of what you are. If ever I had a son, I would hope that he would be like you. Have manner and style and grace and knowledge and wisdom and courtliness and pride. I would want him to know all the things you know. And then, my dear, to fall head over heels in love without asking why or for what. Philip. Oh, Marie. I love you. I love you. You know that. Oh, Philip. Don't go away. Stay with me. Stay with me. eventually had to. My old antagonist, Sir Robert Walpole, who had fastened himself to the prime ministership like a leech, showed me a new courtesy. Young as I was and ambitious, I believed it. Lord Chesterfield, it is my pleasant task to tell you that their majesties and the government are pleased beyond measure with your mission in Holland. The treaty was all we could ask. Well, thank you, Sir Robert. I have a little surprise for you. Yes, of what nature? The Queen wishes private audience with you and her cabinet. Indeed. Chesterfield, don't you ever let that elegant manner of yours be jolted? He who can command his temper and countenance the best will always have an advantage. When does Her Majesty command me to appear? Now. I'm at her service. My Lord Chesterfield, it is good to see you at our court again. Thank you, Your Majesty. We have need of you in this government, home and abroad. No one can speak better for us. The King shares my sentiment. We have important posts only you can fill, 
Important titles only you can grace. You know how high Sir Robert Walpole stands in our favor. Yes. Well, it is our hope you and he can work together for the greater advantage of our country. Your wish is my command. I'm happy that you say that. Because when Sir Robert's new excise bill comes up in Parliament, a bill most important to our well-being and the nation, need I say more? Your Majesty. Philip. Philip, you are not a pretender. You're a man with a heart. Follow it. Follow it. My Lord Chesterfield, are you distracted? Well, oh, no, 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 Your Majesty. I, no, I attend you closely. Oh. I, I will think upon the things you have said and upon you yourself, Your Majesty, with all the loyalty and devotion this one mind can summon. My son, you will read of those days in your history. Sir Robert Walpole withdrew his bill, and I sought retirement in the country. Philip, you're a man with a heart. Follow it. Follow it. Yes, Mary was always with me, though I did not see her. Her voice and her face, her laughter, put heart into my life in a day when a man's manner and words were curtains between himself and other men. So I retired to my melon vines and my writing desk and my thoughts of her. My lord... A messenger from The Hague. The Hague? Show him up at once. He brings this letter by special dispatch. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, Jeffrey, show the messenger the serving quarters and set him a meal and yes, a change. Lord. And leave me alone. Oh, Mary. It's from you. In your dear hand. My heart's pounding to open it. Yet I delay. Oh, what is the news of you, my darling? Hmm. Dearest Philip, our son... Was born a fortnight ago. Is beautiful. If ever I had a son, I would want him to be like you, to know all the things you know. My first letter to you, my son, was written in French when you were only five. On me dit, monsieur, que vous allez voyager et que vous commencerez par la Hollande. La Haye que vous allez visiter en premier est la plus belle petite ville du monde. Others followed regularly. Dear boy, I was very sorry that Monsieur Mater did not give me a good account of you. I'm sure you know that breaking of your word is a folly, a dishonor, and a crime. Attend diligently while you are learning, and thereby excel all other boys. Get a great reputation, and you have a great deal more time to play. Dear boy, I hope you take pains to improve your Greek. Everybody knows Latin, but few people know Greek well, so that you can distinguish yourself by Greek. And do not be discouraged by your first difficulties. But go to the bottom of all those things which every gentleman ought to know well. Yes, my son, I kept my promise to her. I taught you all I had learned. Your life was my life. There were disappointments. Your maiden speech in Parliament. Your gambling in Paris. Your carelessness with your clothes. But tonight, 
You are very close to me. So close, I cannot write you. Tonight it is hard for me to think of you as a mature man of 39 years. 39. My son. Oh, my son, there's still time ahead. I see now the people you may yet win. The courts you may yet grace. The years ahead bright with honor. Perhaps a face. A soft and lovely face. To teach you... As I was taught to hear your heart. My old Chesterfield. Mm. Hey, huh? What? Where? Where? Oh, it's you, Jeffrey. But the fire's out. The room's stock cold. Yeah. You've fallen asleep over your pen. Well, all right, all right. So we have, so we have. Late, sir, almost morning. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I've relived some very pleasant moments, mm. Jeffrey. <laughs> At my age, I. Oh, what you can expect from a tyrant time. Yeah. Oh, me, how lovely she was. Now, I, I beg your pardon? Hmm? Uh, something from yesterday. You'll stay in bed tomorrow, sir, won't you? No, Geoffrey. When I was a boy, my Lord Galway wrote me a bit of advice. If business or pleasure should keep you up till four or five o'clock in the morning... Rise exactly at your usual time. For 70 years, I have risen at 8. I will do so tomorrow. Yes, sir. And when our visitor comes at 11, you will show her to the library at once. Lord Chesterfield? Madam, I am honored. Please don't get up. Oh, no. It's a privilege. It would be cruel to deny me. <sighs> Yeah, this chair, you'll find comfortable, I think. Thank you. Yeah. Well, it's been an old man's morning. I thought the sun had not come out today. I was mistaken. I suppose you wonder who I am. A <laughs> lady's presence is her own credential. You talk just like those letters, don't you? Hmm? Mm-hmm. You're, you're acquainted with my correspondence? A little. Oh, it isn't easy for me to come here. I've been afraid of meeting you until I had to. But, well, I suppose I'd better tell you. Mm -hmm. This is all sort of different than what I expected. You're so polite and all. Madam, I can be as direct as you choose. If there's some matter between you and my son, you may trust my understanding. If my son is in any way indebted to you or owes you anything, please be frank enough to say so. I'm a man of the world. My son is not above indiscretion. Maybe I'd better tell you who I am. Well, that would give us a start. I'm Eugenia Stanhope. Stanhope? Mrs. Philip Stanhope. My son's wife? Yes, I am. Legally and rightfully so. I have the papers to prove it. I don't doubt that, madam. I... I hadn't been informed of this. I suppose he thought you wouldn't like me. Oh, please, But I was good enough to marry him. Eight years ago it was. Eight years, and I never knew. And there are two boys. I left them with the innkeeper's wife. Two sons, my grandsons. Oh, I didn't like keeping it secret. But we read those letters, and each time we'd say, no, not yet. And time kind of went by. I understand, I quite understand. Yes, I am. I'm sure that to you two in love, they were quite irrelevant. Old man's wanderings. Madam, if you're my son's wife, I honor you. You and yours are welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Grandsons, eh? Well, we must plan for them. I, I trust Philip will be here shortly. It's his duty to accompany you on this difficult mission. Oh. He should be here. Don't you know? Don't I know what? Then you don't know. Madam, is something amiss with my son? We... He wasn't well. Oh, yes, yes, I know. He, he, he told me he had a slight complaint. I recommended a milk diet. It, well, if it's anything serious, I beg you in all charity to tell me, madam. Lord Chester, I pray you, madam. Your son... Your son died a week ago yesterday. Died? That's why I'm here. You One see... One moment, madam, if you please. The words are strange. I have to look at them. Philip. My son. Boy. 
It was dropsy, they said. A coma at the end. Oh, it wasn't easy for me either. The nursing and then being left with two children. Let him forgive me. It's all right. I bow to your grief and your loss. My house is at your disposal. You're his widow. I was only his father. Jeffrey! Jeffrey, no, another log on the fire. Yes, Your Lordship. And do stop fussing with those windows. I've got a letter here to finish. Yes, Your Lordship. But the doctor's... Oh, now, did it. it. <laughs> Fiddlesticks, the doctor. What am I to do with my time? That's, you know, I've got two grandsons, two young reps, carriers who haven't the faintest idea how to enter a room or sit in a chair, bow to a lady, or speak a complete sentence. I've got a letter to write. I'll call if I need you. Yes, Your Lordship. Dear boys, the shortest and best way of learning a language is to know the roots of it. I would advise you to write down and learn by heart. Every day, every day, ten, ten words. Jeffrey, Jeff, my lord, Lord Chesterfield. that you publish books here. That is our business. I have something I, I think you might be interested in. Indeed. I am Mrs. Philip Stanhope, daughter-in-law of the late Earl of Chesterfield. Oh, uh, yes, yes. I have in my possession all the letters the Earl wrote to his son. Indeed? I wasn't aware of such a correspondence. Forty years of them on every conceivable subject. I've kept them all. Indeed? <laughs> Very interesting. And you would be willing to have them made public? I hate them. They always made Philip try to be something he wasn't. I never gave him any peace of mind. Driving him. Driving him. I wanted to burn every one of them years ago, but... I know how well thought of the Earl's writings are. Very far-seeing of you, madam. <laughs> Your price. A thousand pounds and royalties. Mm -hmm. We accept it. Uh, are there any conditions? Yes. That they be printed just as they are. All the rules, the directions, the demands as he wrote them. Then let the world judge whether Philip Stanhope was his own failure or whether the letters of the great and elegant Lord Chesterfield made him so. Legend in Brocade by Margaret Leworth was based upon the famous letters of Lord Chesterfield, arbiter of manners and fashions in the 18th century. The special musical score was composed and conducted by Curtis Beaver. Barry Kroger appeared in the role of Lord Chesterfield, and others in the cast included Sarah Burton, Eileen Benson, Ara Gerald, Alfred Shirley, Burford Hampton, Jack Austin, and Harold Young. The Columbia Workshop's director today was Rocco Tito. Next week, the Columbia Workshop presents two essays in dramatic form, Comfort by Robert J. Landry, based on the paper of Aldous Huxley, and Laughter by Gladys Milliner. The special music is by Frederick Steiner and Howard G. Barnes will direct both presentations for the workshop. Tune in next week over most of these same coast-to-coast -coast CBS stations. John Allen Wolf speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>